If this book exists, you're in the wrong universe. Saturday, August 20th, 3.33 a.m. Marshmallows. Hunger at 41%. Blood everywhere. Guy chopped up in my wall. Get here ASAP. I think I left my phone charger there. I had been staring silently at the text message for several minutes. John had sent it, which I had known the moment the phone had dinged. No one else would text me at this hour. Or any other hour, really. The phone hadn't woken me up. I'd gone to bed at 1 a.m., but had just tossed and turned, tormented by two slices of day's old pizza I'd left uneaten in a box on the counter, knowing I would be unable to sleep until I got up to finish the job. I then had a moment of doubt as to whether it was safe to eat sausage pizza that had been sitting at room temperature for that long, so I looked up that information on my phone while standing at the kitchen counter, then wound up tumbling down a rabbit hole of Wikipedia links about the history of food preservation. So now, I was sitting on my kitchen floor, eating rubbery room temperature pizza, and reading about how, in Ireland, they routinely find 4,000-year-old containers of butter that ancient tribes had sunk into the bog for preservation. It's still edible. People have actually tried it. Surprisingly, they say it tastes like shit. A second message deemed in. I think it's by the toaster. I was gonna have to get dressed and go. I knew that. John would just keep messaging me until I did. And yet, my body didn't move. In my current state of mind, it felt like I was being asked to lie face down and drag myself across town with my eyelids. Depression means expending all your energy to avoid having to expend energy. I wish someone would invent a pill that would give me the motivation to go pick up my Lexapro refill. My phone dinged again, this time an image. It appeared to be a pile of meat cut into slabs a few inches thick, with human body parts sprinkled around as a garnish. I saw fingers and half of a foot and a dead face attached to a skull that looked like it had been bisected by a laser, brains oozing out the back. It was all intertwined with scraps of clothing soaked black with blood. I tore off a bite of pizza and chewed. It was like a slab of pizza-flavored gum that had been scraped off a schoolboy's desk. There was nothing here to do or watch. There was no one to talk to. I was miserable where I was, and I would fight anyone who tried to make me leave. I realized this was madness, that I was stuck in a self-pity loop that was turning me into a zombie. I visualized myself throwing away the remaining pizza, getting dressed, brushing my hair, and then driving to see what crisis John had encountered, or, more likely, created. Then, I congratulated myself for having successfully visualized this, and, having not moved an inch, gnawed off another hunk of substance that tasted like pizza in the way that getting splashed by a toilet feels like a water slide. It tasted like the final entry in an experiment to see what, if anything, Americans won't eat. It tasted like a meal that was prepared sarcastically. A fourth message deemed in. It was another image, this one of John's hand holding a thin black cable attached to a plug. With it came the caption, Like this, only white. I stuffed the rest of the pizza in my mouth and managed to shuffle my way into the apartment's only bedroom. I had developed a habit of glancing over to the bed every time I passed, as if I'd magically find Amy there again, the lump under the blankets and the mess of copper hair spilling out, taking her half of the bed out of the middle. I didn't bother this time. That void could be felt from outer space. I tried to think of what clothes would be most appropriate for dealing with a sliced-up corpse, and while I was thinking of that, I robotically pulled out the first t-shirt and pair of cargo shorts I came across on the floor. I went to the fridge, grabbed a can of a locally produced red energy drink called Fight Piss, and headed out, feeling like I'd done all this before. I stepped out onto the rusty metal stairway to find the August night air had been pre-sweated for my convenience. My apartment sits at the second floor of a brick building that looks like it was painted with mayonnaise, the first floor of which used to be an establishment called the Venus Flytrap Sex Shop. The dead neon sign bearing that name still hung over the darkened store entrance, though the big pink cursive X in the third word was missing because somebody had smashed it with a thrown chunk of pavement. That somebody had been me. The couple who had owned the store had taken an insurance buyout after the place got damaged in a flood last year. They'd quickly left town, either forgetting to evict us from the apartment above or deciding they just didn't care. The good news was that the utilities had stayed on, and I had no idea who was paying for them, if anyone. I had been running the little window air conditioner day and night for several weeks, seeing how much free juice I could extract before somebody finally noticed and cut it off. 
The bad news was that they had also left that neon sign on, apparently intending for it to forever buzz pinkly outside my window. It had only taken 12 throws to break it. I slid into my cherry red 1967 Chevy Impala, a car that had been given to me by a former client, and by given, I mean the guy who had owned it is now a vaporized corpse, and his wife left town without saying anything about the car. I keep getting stopped at red lights by bros yelling compliments at me and asking what's under the hood. I have no idea. I don't know anything about cars. And right now, this Impala's defining feature is that it doesn't have AC, and the upholstery gets so sticky that you'd think a toddler had been eating waffles in it. Also, it's hard to steer, and every pothole rattles my teeth. I could probably pick up a lot of girls in it, though, if I was interested in that. Without a glance into the back seat, I said, I wondered when you'd show up. I checked the back seat, but it was empty. It usually was, but I have been ambushed by bad guys waiting in dark back seats before, so every time I get in, I try to say something to mess with them, just in case. I'm thinking about switching it to, I'm surprised you came alone, plant some doubt in their mind. I turned out of the parking lot, the streets mostly deserted at this hour. I passed by a construction site next door. The shop that had burned a while back was being replaced by another payday loan operation. Some kid had spray-painted a swastika on the unfinished plywood, followed by a slur. Then some kind soul had come in with their own can of paint and turned the swastika into a cartoon stick figure in a running pose. Then painted over two letters in the scrawl below it, so that it now read, No Joggers. The racist had never come back to paint a rebuttal, so I took that as progress. Next door was a convenience store called Open 247365, with a slogan below it proclaiming, We are always here for you. It was closed. You know how you'll see a department store go out of business, and then that fall, a sad Halloween supply store will set up in its place? Well, imagine if that happened to an entire city. As always, the actual name of this place will remain undisclosed as to prevent any further tourist deaths. Undisclosed was supposedly nice in the 1980s, but it was trash when I was in high school a little over a decade ago. And since then, we've gone from four McDonald's locations to one, Two burned down, another was closed after a local news investigation detected horse DNA in their milkshakes. The high school basketball team only has four players, and one of them is 36 years old. The number one industry is multi-level marketing schemes, with meth manufacturing coming in a close second. There's a citywide ordinance that all corpses must have their legs and arms severed before burial. If that doesn't sound like a tourist trap to you, well, you're imagining the wrong kind of tourist. On any given day, you can find multiple squads of college kids with cameras looking for an abandoned warehouse or factory to spelunk, hoping to capture some phenomenon or other for their YouTube channel. Once, inside the infamous abandoned shopping mall, a group of ghost hunters pursued noises and voices in the darkness, only to discover they'd been tracking another group of ghost hunters filming for their own channel. These people rarely turned up anything real, that they or their viewers were able to see anyway. But sometimes, a group will step into a darkened structure, and simply never come back out. Which, of course, only ensures more will follow. Meanwhile, just in the last week, John and I had met with a woman who claimed her dead son was texting her photos of his torture chamber in hell, a man who said his dog had been replaced by another identical dog that instead of barking would melodically sing the phrase, kiss my shit, and a young woman who discovered a hole in her bedroom wall in which a twitching, lecherous eye would sometimes appear, despite the fact that on the other side of the wall was her own living room and she lived alone. Our solutions to those problems had been, in order, to take the woman's phone and block her son's number, to laugh at the dog until the owner made us leave, and to sloppily spackle over the hole. Only one of the three paid us anything. And these days we mostly get by on... Hold on. As I get closer to the open 247365, it looks like it is in fact open for business. The lights just weren't very bright inside. That's too bad. It would have been really poignant if they'd been closed. What was I talking about? It doesn't matter. It's all routine for me. Like how the people who live in Pisa probably don't get the fascination with their shitty leaning tower. John keeps up with that stuff more than I do. He says the town's lore among ghost chasers changes every six months or so. Last year, all the YouTubers were saying they had proof that Undisclosed is a testing facility for military psyops warfare, seeing how far reality can be warped via hallucinogens and holograms before a society descends into chaos. Before that, 
They all insisted the town was full of doppelgangers that can transform into horrific monsters via nanobots that rearrange cells on the fly, which is at best a half-truth. An amateur astronomer messaged us around Christmas claiming that he spotted a large geosynchronous satellite parked overhead that doesn't turn up on any records and is almost the size of the International Space Station. Maybe that'll be the new thing. I haven't heard a story about it, but I've no doubt somebody will cook one up, say it's beaming reality bending microwaves at us or something. Humans will twist themselves into knots rather than admit that the unknown might be unknowable. A few minutes and a couple of lazily blinking stoplights later, I arrived in what was considered a pretty good neighborhood in this, in this moldy bathroom carpet of a town. John's place came into view, a two-story house that was mostly painted yellow, aside from a band of the prior black paint at the top that we couldn't reach because his ladder got stolen during the job and he never got around to replacing it. The house was surrounded by a chain-link fence bearing multiple painted signs that said, Do not enter. You will be shot by robots throw deliveries onto the porch. Then, with a scrawled edition at the bottom, accept pizza, yell from yard. John met me at his back gate. His alarm system screeched any time someone pulled in into the driveway or drove past, or if it just got bored and felt like screeching. He was tying his long hair back into a ponytail, as if preparing for some hard labor, and, with some urgency, said, Did you bring the charger? No, sorry, I forgot to look. Things have been really hectic tonight. What's happened? He was already walking away. I followed him into his kitchen. His cabinets were painted black and had labels written in yellow stencil. Baking shit. Here's where the plates live. Drug paraphernalia. Next to his refrigerator was a cabinet the size of a second refrigerator, and on it was an easily missable label that said, Do not open. He said, God, you can already smell it down here. The pic you sent looked a lot like slices of a dead guy on your bedroom floor. Is that a real thing that occurred? It's actually worse than the pictures. Who is it? No idea. Why did you do that to him? Actually, from what I saw, I think I'm more interested in how you did it. I didn't do it, he said matter-of-factly. He wasn't being defensive, he was just letting me know. If he'd had to slice up a dude, he'd have said so. What happened was I woke up and saw, well, it was like a ghostly figure, I guess. Like most of him was standing within the wall, and only the front bit of him was showing. Kind of like when they froze Han Solo and Carbonite. So, I assumed it was a dream, but I felt my teeth, and they were all pretty solid in my mouth. I sit up, and, yeah, he's still there, standing in my wall. So I'm wide awake now, and I say, What is your name, spirit? You did not say that. But he didn't act like he heard me. He says, You will not remember me, but I have granted you a second chance. And as he's talking, he's kind of becoming more solid. I can't see through him well, like he's phasing into the room, like... Like he's beaming down from Star Trek, and the guy operating the beamer didn't know the wall was there. So I ask, what second chance do you speak of, spirit? Why, in your retelling of the story, are you making yourself sound like Ebenezer Scrooge? And then he says, your friend purchased this opportunity for you at tremendous cost, so that you may undo your mistake. What friend, and what mistake? I started to ask him that, but he says, listen carefully, you must... And then he just starts screaming and screaming. Then he fell to the floor in chunks. Because... Well, he had fully solidified, but he was still standing right in the wall. Sliced him right up. Come look. The entity that had visited John was definitely human. Or at least it had human guts. Here's a piece of advice from me to you. If you ever have the chance to smell the inside of a person, don't. Especially the liver. What lay on John's bedroom floor looked like somebody had run an adult man lengthwise through a bandsaw at a slaughterhouse. The front third of him was piled onto the floor like discarded laundry, complete with a sliced-off ribcage, a shocked-looking face, and a pair of bisected feet connected to slivers of shin. The white wall above was a pink splotch in the vague shape of a human body. Judging from the wet scraps of cloth, he'd been wearing a suit and tie. I asked, So where's the rest of him? because sometimes I ask questions even when I desperately don't want to know the answer. Well, there's another thin slice on the other side of this wall. That's Joy's room, and this is where her closet is. She has her shoes in there. His thigh and butt meat is all over them. But the rest is Im embedded in the wall. See this hole I drilled here? You can see his lungs mixed with the insulation. And see the patch of tan down here? That's intestine stuff. His last meals just merged with the plaster and wood and everything. Man, I hope no wires go through here. How in the hell are you going to clean this up? I think we'll have to do it in steps, he said. 
recruiting me into his cleanup operation with the insertion of a single word. And the second step, after we scoop up as much of his entrails as we can, will be knocking out this wall, studs included. This whole section has to go, all that embedded tissue. Sledgehammer and saws all. And it can't wait either. That stink is gonna embed itself in the whole house if we don't move fast. Joy is gonna kick my ass if she walks in the door and gets greeted by that smell. Also, if the cops come, it's gonna be hard to explain it, so probably best to dispose of all this before the sun comes up. Oh, and look at that. You've already got the tools out. And those buckets over there are to haul out debris. I definitely need to start asking for more information before I just race over to your house like this. Alright, we need a backup. I take it you don't recognize this guy? If he even was a guy? No. Do you? He nudged the sliced off face with his toe. Not in this state, no. What did he look like before he was bisected? Wearing just a dark suit? White shirt? The guy himself seemed muscular, like he had that kind of face, you know? Skin real tight around his jaw. And you see the long blonde hair there. Remember Kelly? Used to be in the band? I'd say he looked like how Kelly thought he looked. And he didn't say anything else. No, what I told you was the whole thing. It all happened over like 30 seconds. But he said he was doing this, whatever this is, at someone's request. That's definitely what he said. A friend. I figured he meant you. No, this is the first I'm hearing of it. And it was to undo some mistake you made? Yeah, to give us a second chance. My point is, if he was telling the truth, what are we supposed to do in response to that? I mean, right now, what do we do? How do we know what mistake we made? John lit a cigarette while he considered it. It's tough, because I had previously assumed we'd done everything in our lives perfectly up to now. Don't tell Joy I smoked in the house. John picked up a snow shovel that had been leaning in the corner. So we shovel this up and dump it all in the incinerator. Then we bust out this whole tainted section of wall and burn all the chunks of that, too. John had an incinerator installed in his garage a few weeks ago, after the Eve incident. We'd since found that there aren't many objects, living or non-living, that won't break down at 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. Only once had we had to use it on someone that was still alive at the moment of insertion, and after 20 minutes in the oven, all that was left of it was a few scales, claws, and its tiara. He continued, We got a few hours before it gets light out, so if we have it all done by then, nobody will see the smoke and get curious. Then we'll go to Waffle House and have breakfast. On me. Then we'll stop by Ace to rent a carpet shampooer. And maybe one of those ozone machines to get the stink out. Boom. Done. Good as new. Except for the hole in the wall, but as far as I'm concerned, it just turns into a shared closet. I'll explain it to Joy when she gets back. She'll understand. Joy was John's roommate. I, I guess. I mean, I know who she is. I just don't know how to describe their relationship. She'll probably turn up later. I'll, I'll just explain it then. I said, All right, put on some music that'll get me motivated, and light a scented candle or something. Let's do this. Well, we weren't done by sunrise. We weren't done by lunchtime, either. All told, the cleanup took 13 fucking hours. I'm not going to detail the process, because I don't feel like it. It turned out that a lot of the wall material wouldn't turn all the way to ash, so we had to scoop it out of the incinerator and bury it in the yard. The cops actually showed up twice because of the complaints about the stench. There is a reason there are no air fresheners that smell like charred insulation and hair. But John's solution to this was to just tell them exactly what was going on. They walked away before he could finish the story, telling us to wrap it up and stop stinking up the neighborhood. By the time the project was finished, we were both so tired, sick, and pissed off that we didn't go to Waffle House, and in fact, were barely speaking to each other. It was late afternoon by the time I left, and the day had grown as hot as the dashboards in Hell's parking lot. As soon as I stepped through my door of my apartment, I got a text from John that said, I forgot to tell you we have a client appointment at 7. I closed my eyes and groaned. Fuck. I threw my keys on the counter and went and sat on the edge of the bed. I do that sometimes. Just sit there and stare at the wall. Alone. I grabbed my phone and began sorting through my old pictures. Nobody tells you that when someone is suddenly gone from your life, you lose their face almost immediately. Like, you can't perfectly bring them to mind without a photo for reference. Amy had only been gone for 13 days, and already she was fading. I scrolled to a pic from a couple of years ago, of Amy and a friend from her old job standing in a public bathroom. There was a huge, angry sign on the wall behind them that said, Do not flush foreign objects down toilet. 
Amy, whose red hair was having a frizz day, was smiling and giving a thumbs up with her right slash only hand. Her friend was holding a store-bought apple pie, still in the box, making like she was about to tip it into the toilet nearby. Amy's face was a constellation of freckles, around green eyes and a smile that said she thought what was happening was literally the funniest thing anyone had ever done. Looking at her drove a hot blade through my sternum. I wanted to cancel John's client appointment, but deep down knew that was a bad idea. What would I do instead? Sit here on the bed in silence? A man can drown in silence like this. My life these last 13 days has been a chain of distractions, like continual gasps for air above the surface of that terrible, waiting stillness. But how long can a man live like that? Get up, get some coffee, take a shower, get ready for the job. That's what Amy would want you to do. So I did just that. I stood up to head for the bathroom, only mildly surprised to find two hours had passed.